Hello everyone and welcome today. Um, my name is Lee Walker and I'm the Publishing Director at Oxford University Press here in Australia. It's good to be with you um, to present, discuss some research we've recently conducted on the knowledge and skills gap some of you might be experiencing in your maths classrooms. During the roundtable today, we're going to attempt to address the gap We'll start addressing the gap by looking at some of the issues the survey tackled with some very experienced and knowledgeable guests. So please welcome Janine Sprakel from the Australian Maths Trust. Feel free to wave if you want, Janine. Kim Beswick from Uni of New South Wales. Patrick Mette from Haleybury. Oh, I was just concentrating on your last name so much, I've just got Haleybury wrong. Peter Sullivan from Monash University. Um, Simone Zmood from Monash University and also Evan Kerno from OUP is going to join us a little bit later and help us out with questions. Um, just before we start, um, we'll do an acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Joe. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Oxford University Press acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia because we're all from different parts of Australia today and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples today. Next slide, slide please, Joe. So here's a quick overview of today's session. It's pretty jam packed for 45 minutes. I'll do an intro on the research. Then Janine's gonna take over and talk about some problem solving strategies. And then we'll get into the guts of some discussion um, about um, the knowledge and skills gap with our various deemed experts. We'll have a Q&A session. We wanna try and fit in as many questions from you as possible. Um, and then we'll tell you a little bit about what Oxford's been doing to actually address the gap um, based on the research that we've done. Next slide, please. Ah, questions. So again, we would love to hear from you today. So submit your questions via the chat. And we've got lots of OUP people on standby to start um, helping coordinate those questions. And so we can um, start answering, toward this, answering them towards the end of the session. We will follow up with you if there are questions that aren't, uh, aren't attended to today. So um, please know that we will resolve any questions that you have. Um, and we'll work with our experts to do that for you. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the knowledge and skills gap. So just a little bit about the research. Um, and what I talk about in the research paper um, is about the future of work becoming more STEM focused and that maths knowledge and skills have been defined as really critical to future life chances. And I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted here. And in the 21st century, maths is at the heart of most innovations in the information economy. And so the rapidly evolving nature of knowledge and work and technologies demanding stronger understanding, reasoning and problem solving skills. However, national and international assessment results show that many Australian students are failing to acquire a knowledge and skills repertoire that is at pace with their level of schooling and are falling behind. A survey conducted by us, by OUP, this year revealed that 94% of the respondents surveyed concerned about the gap Oh, well, they're concerned about the gap following the transition from primary to secondary school. And I'm sure the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated that somewhat. And almost all teachers believe that the gap in year seven has consequences for students on the term learning. So teachers told us that students are coming from primary school without fundamentals, such as knowing their multiplication tables, and that it's difficult to cover the content at year level standards when one is constantly trying to catch them up. Teachers' views about the size of the skills gap range from, range from one to more than five years, which even I was surprised at, but maybe I shouldn't be so surprised, with the widest skills gap in years seven, eight and nine. And additionally, the OUP survey revealed low teacher confidence in preparedness of students moving into year 10 and, and senior mathematics. One teacher said to us that the spread of student levels has increased hugely over the past 15 years. I wonder why it's 15 years to a point that it is virtually impossible for a single teacher in a classroom to successfully engage all students. So as teachers, and that's what we're here to talk about today, how do we or how can we address the gap? So let me now hand to Janine, who's going to talk about the impact teaching good problem solving strategies has on students learning. So over to you, Janine. Thanks, Lee. 
I thought I'd start off with a problem today just to get your thinking. So if you flick to the next slide, this is one of my favourite problems to use with a big group of children and I often work with children that I don't know. So I come in with a few problems up my sleeve um, to get them warmed up and get them used to me and, and the way I operate. So my house number is made up of three digits whose sum is 15. What could my house number be? Now that's how the question was posed to me originally. And we took it and we played around with it and we did the problem. And this is the first thing that you'll learn from me is that I insist that all of the teachers I work with sit down and actually spend some time doing the problems. Because what happens if Evan can flick to the next slide, you then grow it into a low floor, high ceiling and what, I, what a teacher I met last week at the MAV regional conference called a wide wall problem. So we want students to be able to stretch themselves in all ways. Next slide, Evan, thanks. And, and the next one. And by doing the problem, teachers then can develop the enabling and extending prompts. So if one digits five, the others four, what numbers could my house number be? If two of the digits are fours, what numbers could I be? And then you can extend. And I think I'd like um, to stress here, I would extend every student in the classroom, not just the early finishers and not just the very capable students. Next slide, please. So, I knew this had happened. <coughs> what is problem solving? It's lots of things. It's not just the worded problems from, the, from a textbook, although sometimes they can be really good prompts or start off problems. And it's more than just a plug or play into an algorithm. It can be something we can work on together or something we do by ourselves. And it has a result that's not immediately obvious. Or, for the next slide, as one of the teachers that I worked with and I was chatting with on Twitter said, it's about not seeing the end at the beginning. And I think if we can get our students used to seeing that and used to doing that, and it takes a little bit of time, it doesn't happen in your first problem solving session. I think once we get them used to that, then they're doing all of the things that we want them to do when they're doing problem solving. So if we move to the next slide, because we know that students could go all the way through school and never really encounter a decent problem solving session, and they may well be successful, but they may not have applied that that knowledge, that understanding in a new context. And that means that they're going out to the real, real world where there's lots of different problems to be solved and they haven't, haven't done it before. Next slide. So what's your job? You're modeling, you're noticing, you're listening, you're supporting students, you're encouraging students to communicate their strategies, you're rewarding perseverance and you're assessing student progress. As well, Next slide. You're doing the problem. That's a very old photo of me, but I wanted to use this whole set of photos to show um, a little problem solving session we ran quite a while ago. Next slide. If you want to think about some of the big names that you could um, read while you, you're setting all this up in your school, of course you're going to look at Polya, who mapped out strategies including understanding the problem, devising the plan, carrying out the plan and looking back. But what we want to be able to do as well is what Alan Schoenfeld talks about. And I think his, his more holistic approach to the strategies, he asks the teacher to consider the resources that the student brings to the session. And those are that, that's that basic mathematical knowledge. He, he likes to talk about heuristics or the strategies and techniques that you're going to use. He talks about control, and this is student control. How are they going to plan how to tackle the problem? And he's a big believer in um, developing student self-belief of themselves as mathematicians, or what I've called a personal mathematical identity. So to help your students, you can go through what AMT have developed as our structure for a good problem solving session, where you launch, solve, reflect, extend and connect. When you're launching, you're understanding the problem. This is the student understanding the problem and the student is discussing key concepts, clarifying terms. Teachers need to have thought about what the possible pitfalls are going to be. And then in the next step, students are starting to solve the problem. This is the plan that they've devised, now they're carrying it out. 
You are there as a teacher to prompt but not solve the problem. And if Evan flicks to the next slide, you'll see some of my favourite questions from Tracy Zager. She's written a book, Becoming the Maths Teacher That You Wish You'd Had, or Math Teacher That You Wish You'd Had. And she's got lists and lists of great prompts. I have them around the classroom to remind myself to get better at asking questions. What's going on here? What do you notice? What do you wonder? Let's refresh our memories about what each of these numbers represents. What does that something mean? Did you have a picture in your mind when you read the problem? Can you share it with us so we can see what you saw and so on? Next slide, thanks Evan. And then we look back and check, and this is a step that often students like to whiz by and they forget. Carefully managed by the teacher, you are now drawing out the really nice bits of the conversations that you heard as you're cruising around the room. Can you check that your answer is correct? Are there other possible strategies? Can the solution be generalised? And so on. And now we extend all students so that they've got something to take with them, some confidence building, a new strategy, a new skill, and allowing time for consolidation at this point is really important, where you might pose a similar task that you might have thought about when you did the problem a week before for yourself. You're starting to build this really lovely repertoire of problems that are a bit similar, problems that, that assess the same kinds of skills and so on. So now we want to connect it to the real world. And often that can be a bit tenuous and I wouldn't suggest that you um, stretch the connection to the real world, but if you can, if there's a connection, make it and help students understand it. On the website that we've developed for teachers, Problemo, we've got over 500 problems ready to go and they've got all of the enabling prompts suggested there for you if you want to use those or you can make up your own, but that's there for years three to ten. And that's me. And I think I kept to five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, just as we get into the virtual roundtable, if you've got any questions for Janine, just post them in the chat. And um, I reckon we'll have time to answer them today, as well as the questions that you might have for our other experts. So um, I've got some questions here. Some of them have already come from um, teachers from around Australia, um, but I'm gonna ask you, Simone, first. How can teachers quickly and efficiently understand individual learning needs with limited teaching time? So what we're doing today is we're just, we're, we're talking to some issues that the research has raised, the research that we've done has raised about how can we close that gap? So limited teaching time. How do you respond to that, Simone? Uh, so interesting, I was just listening to Janine um, and look, we already, I think a lot of teachers say we already do a lot of testing. So it's not about doing more testing. It might be looking at some of the testing we do to make sure that we're actually getting insights into students' misconceptions. Um, but I think something really important that we do is actually walk around and observe and listen to the conversations. And so problems like Janine presented actually allow us to get more insight into how students are thinking about their mathematics. And then there's the also opportunity to touch on uh, with them, how are you feeling about this? To find out how they're feeling about mathematics, how they're feeling about being back in the classroom after the various lockdowns in the different states, um, and really trying to understand their connection with maths, their feeling about themselves as mathematics learners. And, you know, once that rapport is established, students can tell you things that give you a lot of insight uh, into where they might be finding things easy, where they might be finding challenges. So it's about building that knowledge, I think, and trust. And that gives you a lot of information then to interpret any of the test data that you're getting as well, because it's, some of the test data won't tell us why students are making mistakes. It will just tell us what those errors are. Mm. Mm, and um, Patrick, I'm going to put you on the spot um, for a minute and get you to respond because you were back in the classroom today. I know you've been teaching remotely, um, but you know, did, uh, how's the difference between teaching remotely and being back in the classroom? Where they might be finding things easy, where they might be finding challenges. So it's about have limited teaching time, um, and you're really you're really focused on um, students experiencing success. Maybe there's a contrast there between what happens in the classroom you know, face to face and what what success looks like and what success looks like remotely. I've sort of just rewritten that question, but because you were back in the classroom right. today, I you've, just... Yeah, just you've, rewritten it, you've, written, you've rewritten how exactly how I'd answer it. The success just looks very different in both those situations. Mm. So online, um, especially dealing, um, teaching a lot of the younger kids, so year seven and eight students, uh, success has really looked like giving tasks, giving skills, giving knowledge that 
is accessible and almost has like one direct task that you're working on that day, one task that you can achieve in with some um, some standards for success as well. So that's what it looks like online, sort of like just these 20 minute parts, 30 minute parts, 40 minute parts where you can really be successful, get something out of it. And it's really easy for the student to measure and understand what they have achieved that in that day um, or in that lesson. Uh, in person, you can be a bit more flexible, I find. So you can look around, you can talk to people, just those conversations do look a little bit different. So the insights you gather are a little bit different, and therefore success looks, looks a little bit different as well. But um, the big difference for me has been, I'd say, a little bit more rigid online. I have one thing that I'd like you to do, like one thing that I'd like you to succeed in, well, it parts, 40 minute parts, where you can really be successful, get something out of it. And it's really, success can just look a little bit different depending on the people in front of you, the environment in front of you. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Peter Sullivan, I'm going to turn to you now because um, just to build on that question about um, incorporating challenging questions into teaching plans, how often should we do that? What does that look like again in a real classroom and, and maybe what that might look like when you've got kids learning from home? And you're on mute, Peter. I think as Patrick was saying, um, the the challenging approach and even a problem solving approach to to learning uh, remotely is actually more difficult and for two reasons one is it's hard to actually engage the level of frustration of the student but it's also hard to keep the parent away from telling them how to do the question and so uh, it, it is actually a very difficult challenge but in terms of how frequently it should be ha it should happen one of the things I would have liked to have said about Janine's presentation that was very helpful is that there you sometimes see reports in the paper and even probably you hear from colleagues saying, oh, yeah, but inquiry approaches don't work. Problem solving doesn't work. We have to uh, tell the students what to do. Now, there was a in 2012, the PSAP conducted a part of this study that they called cognitive activation. Now, this was done by half a million students. And what they said and the questions that they were asked, how frequently the teachers did this, and that is the actions like reflecting on a problem, uh, thinking about problems for extended periods of time, working on problems for which the solution is not obvious, learning from mistakes, doing problems in two ways. And the result was the more frequently the teachers did those things, the better off the student scores were. And that is the actions like this is a massive study that was very well conducted. And, and the difference, the 19 point difference in scores between teachers who were doing those sorts of things frequently, what Janine was talking about, and those that hardly did them at all, was was uh, like the equivalent of years of learning. And so that uh, I would say that to schools that don't incorporate uh, problem solving approaches, uh, and, you know, as frequently as possible, uh, they have to actually be able to demonstrate from their own evidence that those approaches are not working because the evidence is quite clear they do work. And, and so I think we have to try and uh, find ways to, uh, you know, resource teachers to do that. I mean, part of, I'm, I'm be interested in Patrick's comment about this, but um, a lot of teachers find that students' capacity or willingness to engage with problems actually declines over the secondary school years. And, uh, and so I think we have to find ways to provide teachers with resources and, and pedagogical strategies uh, to be able to support that approach to teaching as frequently as, as possible. If I can just jump in and respond to that as well. I think, um, look, it's evident exactly what you just said about that, I guess, pedagogical motivation as you go through. I think, um, especially in terms of problem solving and seeing something new, and I think there's a couple factors at play. First thing is, um, I guess, students being, uh, having, questions put in front of them that just aren't attainable to them just yet. We really need to find out exactly where the student is at and accommodate the task, accommodate the learning to exactly what they need in front of them. And obviously that's the big challenge. That's exactly what this entire uh, project has been about. It, about. it is about acknowledging just that gigantic range of people you have in front of you. So you need the flexibility, you need the preparation, and realistically that comes in as a whole department, a whole school situation where you're all preparing, you're all, um, aiming to accommodate the range of people in front of you. So first thing is I find is that when uh, students aren't given tasks that, to them that, that is attainable, that they can't be successful in, that they can't actually approach and find uh, find that success in, 
that's where they lose that motivation. And as you go through the year seven, eight, nine, where that gap gets even bigger, that's where you lose them as well. So it's important that we understand where they're at and we accommodate. That's the most important part. Can you just talk a little bit? Oh, uh, sorry, I don't want to dominate the experts' time. Simone, you've got something to respond. I was actually going to add further. I think it's yeah. really important, particularly with students and in classes and schools where there's not a lot of problem solving, that we need to recognise that when people are unfamiliar with things, they're not confident with it. So the more that students get exposed to problems, exposed to challenge, the more willing they are to uh, attempt things that might look completely unfamiliar, but they, they'll be prepared to sit down and look and think about what could I do, what strategies could I use, how could I pull it apart? Um, and some ways that we can give students problems that are completely unfamiliar is by giving them things from their real lives. Um, so, you know, year nine, year 10 students starting to work, they might even be getting some superannuation. Well, how are they going to make a decision about, you know, so we can actually find really good applications that then link back very clearly to mathematics and, and help motivate them to actually want to think about it mathematically. Um, but if we don't start, then they don't expand their comfort zone. And, and I think that's a really important thing to remember. And I work with adults who are starting now and it, it would have benefited if they'd had these sorts of opportunities at school so that they could make really good decisions as young adults and as older adults. And I think that's exactly where your relationship and rapport with the student comes in as well. Um, what a student finds very difficult, especially in a problem solving situation, even dealing with new content that they're finding difficult. It's all about um, that positive reinforcement, showing them exactly what their successes has, have been. They might not necessarily get to the goal. They might necessarily get the answer they're looking for in that problem solving situation. But as the teacher, as the onlooker, as the facilitator in that environment, you're actually able to pick out and tell them, oh, this is what you did really well. I love that discussion that you, you three people just had or that this, this attempt you've had by yourself as well. Um, they, this young people, they're, they're young people, they don't always see those successes themselves. So it's your role to utilise the relationship you have with that young person and say, this are the things you've done so well, I want to keep seeing it. And Kim, I just want to give you the opportunity to talk about, you know, implementation of problem solving in classrooms with that limited time, just to add to um, what Patrick's just said about how you manage manage that time. Well, I, I think it depends a lot on the expertise of the teacher in a way too and their confidence. Um, if, if a teacher's not really sure of the mathematics involved and not confident about that, then it's really hard to make calls on the fly that you have to about which of the students' responses might be worth pursuing and which you might put off, um, which of them are going to be productive leads to follow. So I think it really depends on the teacher having some confidence about that, um, which is based on um, sufficient knowledge, but, al but also their beliefs about what they're trying to do in their maths class. So if a teacher doesn't think that maths is about problem solving, if they think it's just about learning facts, then obviously they're going to, um, you know, be disinclined to teach in the way that Janine was explaining to us. So, yeah. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm just going to turn to Evan now. I know there are a couple of questions that um, the audience has started to ask, and I know he's been tracking those. So, Evan, do you just want to pop in? Yeah. Nice to see you, Evan. Evan's our... Hi. He's, he's one of our, well, he is our senior mathematics um, subject matter expert at OUP. So um, I'm going to hand it to you to do some facilitation, if you don't mind. Sure. So we have a question from Connor Ross here. Um, how does the ACER land type test, which all graduate teachers are required to complete regardless of teaching method, aim to address the growing skill gap and knowledge gap in mathematics proficiency? So um, not sure who, if any of you want to, um, Kim, yep. You're on uh, mute. Kim, you're on mute. It basically doesn't aim to address that gap at all. That's, that's not its purpose. Um, it was designed to um, assure the public and the government that teachers, all teachers were in the top 30% of ability of the, you know, the population. It, as far as numeracy goes, and that that's its purpose, and that's that's pretty much all it does. Um, yeah, so it doesn't really help us in what we're talking about today. Peter, would you agree with that? I saw you put your hand up. Yeah, no, I, I put my hand down because I was going to say exactly what Kim said. So that's I agree with that 100%. <laughs> 
Okay, um, Simone, you're on mute. Well. I might just jump in, and I absolutely agree with what Kim and Peter said. The test is not designed to do that. Um, however, with my work with pre-service teachers um, in preparing them or letting them know about uh, the Lantite test um, and working with some small groups as well who possibly didn't have the numeracy confidence um, before they sat the test. It can be used by those uh, pre-service teachers who are motivated to help them consolidate their numeracy skills and further develop them. And particularly for, for teachers where it, they haven't done much mathematics in recent years, um, it, it, it provides an opportunity to then become more fluent. It is a time test, um, but the test itself is not designed to do that. It's about other people deciding to use it as an opportunity uh, to consolidate and refine the learning. Uh, but as Kim initially said, it's not what the test was designed to do. Kim, um, did you have anything to add? Um, no, thanks. <laughs> OK, um, we have another question from Phil Murray. Um, so many schools are going down the route of online math programs, such as Math Pathways. Is there any evidence that this mode of instruction is creating gaps in the students' maths development? Simone, yes. Uh, microphone back on. Thanks for asking that question, Evan. I think particularly after a year and a half of, of a mixture of remote learning, um, we're really thinking about how we use technology, um, not just face-to-face -face and live, but also recorded technology to learn. Um, and I actually hopped on recently to look at what uh, research there was, what empirical research and what evidence there is about uh, some of these online maths programs. Um, and it's fairly limited at the moment. So I'd, I'd be reluctant to make any claims with that regard. Uh, what I can say is it's obviously an area, given the changing world that we live in, that, that needs more research um, to understand both the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, having spoken to teachers at schools uh, that have brought maths pathway in uh, and in some schools that have brought it in and then not continued with it, I think anecdotally uh, there are in some cases um, it's it's not been implemented the way that the program was designed to be implemented. So it's it's meant to students are meant to be using the online tools um, to learn individually, but there's also meant to be group work with rich tasks and class discourse. And the teacher through both the online learning and those class discourse and, and problem solving is really really critical. Uh, and so perhaps in the schools where it hasn't worked well, um, there's been that that element of either the the teachers not feeling confident, as Kim mentioned earlier, about out of field teaching um, or to use it as a resource, just the way that teachers are meant to use textbooks as a resource, not as a replacement for the teacher. Great. Um, Patrick, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to add to that? Every time I was going to say something, Simone just dropped that exact knowledge bomb I was looking for. I was just going to say as well, it does come down to um, one implementation, but also just the confidence of the person in front of you. You again, um, in that sort of situation, you're dealing with significant flexibility that's required. Um, and I think in an ideal environment, you've got um, you're trying to aim your teaching and learning at uh, the people in front of you, exactly where they're at. I think the one thing that is missed is the teaching and the instruction in a lot of those situations. You very, very rarely find an opportunity opportunity to sit in front of people and show them exactly how to do the maths and have those discussions. And that's obviously what's lost. Um, so any one thing I'd point out is the most important time we have with the students is when we're there in front of them. And um, unfortunately, I think that's the part that gets lost exactly in that situation. Great. Um, Peter, you also have your hand up. You know, I, there was actually uh, an earlier quote that uh, any teacher who thinks that that their students would be better taught by a computer-based program should actually give up their job. <laughs> and I, I think that learning learning is a social experience, and not that there's not some opportunity for for uh, learning with um, you know uh, you know online tools. Um, I think that the uh, the social thing is so important. And in fact, I would say that the challenge is the other way to the way the question was posed. I think there's a, a there's a need for people who promote you know, pathways or whatever the, the program is to actually provide the evidence that it does work and it produces more students selecting uh, it, selecting mat, senior, you know, advanced maths and um, in the senior years and more students completing year 12 maths and more students 
going on to study maths at university as a result of that experience. So I think the the expectation, you know, the pressure should be on the the people who are marketing those programs uh, to actually demonstrate. And, and teachers who are just using the programs as an alternative to doing their own planning and simply sitting at the front reading the newspaper while the students work on the computer, I think it needs to be called out. Um, Kim. Do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I do agree with everything that Peter said, but but just in, in some slight defence of some teachers who might do that, sit in the front and let the kids go with the computer, I think sometimes an out-of-field teacher is concerned not to do harm, so not to teach something that's wrong. So there is a temptation then to rely on a textbook or a program or something to just to make sure they get the maths right. And I think that really is an indictment of our education system that we have teachers in that position. Um, who who don't have um, more resources than that to draw upon. So, um, you know, those teachers obviously need lots of support from their colleagues and um, you know, from from their systems and, and whatever. But sometimes they do that because they just don't have the confidence and the wherewithal to do anything else. I, th I think that's a really good lead into the next question we have from Mark Ward. So he says, we have some wonderful problem solving resources such as Maths 300, Resolve, and Problemo, um, how can we ensure a better use of these in schools? Um, and is there something in the pipeline to encourage the use of these? So I'll start with Janine on this issue. Janine, you're on mute at the moment. Thanks, Evan. Um, I, I saw that question pop up and I thought, oh, yes. There, there was supposed to be a teacher arm of the Chief Scientist Star Portal that didn't happen um, because they had their funding cut. So I'm not sure what what's happening there, but coming is the maths hub, which is the mathematical equivalent of the digital teacher hub. And that's Education Services Australia are, are putting that together and they're pulling in all of those resources together. I'm on the committee. I know people from um, from Resolver on the committee, people from ANSI there, you know, it's it's got lots of good stuff there, but you're right, it's, it's so hard to find good quality stuff. And most of the organisations who are producing the highest quality stuff are like AMT, where we're either we've got 300 volunteers and, and 50 odd staff. Um, we're charities, we're not for profits, we're doing it on an absolute shoestring, or we're in universities where we've got a teaching load like Kim, Peter, and, and Simone, or we're classroom teachers like Patrick. I mean, it, it, it's just we're all stretched, but where the quality is coming from, yes, it definitely needs to be funded. Absolutely. Uh, Patrick, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would. Just in terms of implementation of um, a lot of these problem solving uh, opportunities, I think the one thing that's important is that whatever is about to be applied, whatever skill set, it's something that's been taught, before, it's already been taught, something that's known to them. Um, so the foundational skills, say if they're working with areas of squares or areas with basic shapes, they understand that basic fundamental first, and then they're looking to apply, they're looking to expand, they're asking the, those amazing questions, um, but giving them a platform from uh, to start with, to understand and have that fluency developed means that they can then further be successful moving forward. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I can see, Simone, you've got your hand up. To expand, they're asking me if there's. A it just occurred to me um, that giving them a platform from schools uh, implement those resources within the school. Teachers have to feel comfortable, um, and there's quite a bit about mathematics circles and mathematics teacher circles on the internet. Um, and I know that mathematics teacher circles is in Australia now. That can be a, a great way for a group of mathematics teachers, primary and or secondary even inviting a mathematician to come and join to really get together and have that experience themselves of being in that open discursive mode, discussing with different background knowledge. Um, and once teachers have that experience amongst other adults, um, it can be easier then to look at the different resources that are available, such as from Resolve and Math 300 and Problemo and think about how can we incorporate that into a teaching program. But I think experiencing problem solving yourself is a really good first step to thinking about how can we bring this to our students as well. Yeah, I think there's lots definitely to think about there. Um, OK, so we have another question from um, David. So David said communication of mathematical thinking is very important. Is there any opportunity for students to develop this with an online math program? 
And so do any of our experts want to um, chime in there? I, I might even just jump in quickly and give everyone a chance to think. But when I was doing a little bit of research on Math Pathways and some of the other ones, um, so for instance, in Math Pathways, there is that designed into their program. The question is whether people do it. Um, I know that there are some programs in the US where it, students can participate fully online and they do have those discussions online. So while the technology is there, the question is whether the programs themselves offer it. Like, can I log, have, a, you know, some of my students log in at two o'clock on a Monday and join group of students from all over, you know, Australia um, and they're going into breakout rooms and those sorts of things. And the question is whether people do it. Programs, yet yeah, these online resources offer that. But certainly I think this is about whether there's a desire for it, the technology is certainly moving to allow it. Yeah, does anyone else want to um, add anything to that? I can jump in here too, Evan. I think there's lots of stuff, um, again, that's around that it's hard to get teach in front of teachers and in front of classrooms. Um, AMT run the computational algorithmic thinking competition um, we've just offered it to remote and very remote schools around the country for free to try and grow the, the base. And that gives students the opportunity to talk about amongst themselves. It's not just about being a computer programmer, but to actually talk about what the algorithm means and, and the steps and the, and the components to it. And I know that a lot of the resolve questions have got really nice wording for how to communicate your thinking. And again, I go back to Tracy Zager and you cubed both of those I know they're American, but the, the the prepared stuff, the giving the teacher the spiel that they can then go and confidently use in the classroom is really useful. Okay, I just thought I'd mention as well, some people have mentioned some resources in the chat. So mm -hmm. if any of you um, just want to take a look at the chat, then um, there's some good suggestions there. We're finished with one final question from, um, apologies, I forget your name wrong, Norhana Abdullah. Um, she, um, they say, students in my college of low ability, they have gaps in basic slash fundamental mathematic, mathematical knowledge. How can I close out these gaps? Um, Kim. Mm, um, just briefly, I could say quite a bit about this, I think, but, but I think older students who've got gaps in their ability are probably, in, in just in their knowledge, are probably the norm. I know I've probably got gaps in my knowledge just from having not paid attention for various moments at various times. <laughs> and we certainly all develop the depth of our understanding over the years as well. So I think it's not unusual, but um, students who have low ability, whatever that means, and that's controversial too, um, when they're older, they're not the same as, as the primary school child who might have, you know, been supposed to learn about place value, for example, if they get to year 10 or 11 and they don't know place value. They're an older child, they're a different person, they think differently and they can learn differently. So um, it's not helpful um, to go back and, and treat them as if they're in year two or year three or whenever that content would originally have been taught. Um, but there are many um, interesting problems that are age appropriate for those kids that you can use where those more fundamental ideas will come up. Um, because the most important thing for children, you know, adolescent kids, um, is to feel like they fit in with their peers. So um, we must be careful when we're addressing their gaps that we don't just reinforce the negative kinds of attitudes they've probably already got, which might have been part of why they've got the gaps uh, uh, about themselves as maths learners and about the subject. So we have to proceed carefully and treat them, you know, with some respect as adult, or not adult, but adolescent learners, not small children. Great, that's really helpful, Kim. I'll just go to Patrick and then we'll finish up with Peter. Yeah, I'd very, um, actually I'm going to agree with the respect side of things as well. Um, you have to acknowledge that these underachieving students have always found this content specifically difficult. Addressing their gaps that we don't just... Sometimes you need to be a bit more direct about what that support looks like for those skills that are missing as well. Um, so what I find really helpful in terms of being in a classroom is just some ongoing revision of the fundamental skills that we are talking about, the fractions, the times table skills, these things that we know are uh, the proportionality of uh, fractions as well. Um, we need to address these things on more of an ongoing basis. As you hit year seven, year eight, year nine, they tend to, we tend to learn in clumps. We learn algebra, we learn geometry, we learn measurement, but we never stop to actually address the things we learned in the previous year or the previous month. 
So an ongoing uh, retrieval practice I find is just incredibly uh, beneficial just to helping those students be far more comfortable with the understanding, with the knowledge, and they're seeing it far more often as well, which is important. Right, and Peter, uh, do you want to have the final word on this? Uh, the, one of the things that, that the, the students that you're talking about, uh, whoever asked that question, is that those students have probably felt pressured for time all the way through their learning. Mm -hmm. And so structuring classes in a way that gives students time to think. Now, the, the problem that Janine uh, that Jean put up at the start of the session, which I think there are 80 separate answers. Is that correct? Um, the, uh, this, uh, that problem is it, accessible by everybody, but it also has capacity to extend the students who might get finished. And structuring the lessons so that you give everyone time is, is, a, is a really powerful way of engaging students who might look like they're working below the level of the task, but with time they can engage. And so trying to find the right, you know, like pedagogical support for students is so important. That's really good. Well, hopefully you all got something out of that. And I'd just like to take the time now to thank all of our um, participants today um, and also to everyone who added in some questions. We've just got a few final things to mention before we wrap up today, just flip to the next stage. So um, we've got some forthcoming resources and PD opportunities. So we have a new seven to 10 math series, which we've been developing um, and with some contribution from the AMT as well. So we'd encourage you all to take a look at that. The website there um, will give you all some more information. Um, yeah. We're really proud of it, so hopefully you all can take a look at it. Peter also has a new book coming out in the um, coming months, which is about building engagement in middle year mathematics. Um, and he has a number of different learning sequences here. Um, there's a sample chapter which you can access online at the um, website, which Steph will post the link to as well. And this was one of our professional development sites um, at Oxford University Press, particularly over the last year with the changing dynamics, we've put a lot of work into our professional development offering. So at our new oup.com.au PD website, we have on-demand videos and insights from education experts, as well as teacher education resources. So please do check that out. Finally, I'd just like to mention a couple of upcoming events we have in the next few weeks. So in two weeks time, we have a, um, talk by two um, teachers in Victoria about our new Oxford Maths series. And this, this um, talk is about successfully differentiating maths lessons to address gaps in learning. So that definitely, I think, covers some of the questions that were asked um, towards the end of today's session. And the second session is about cross-curricular learning through STEAM. So this is presented by Helen Sylvester. Katrina Davy and Edward Chin. So hopefully um, some of you come and join us at those sessions. I know that'd be fantastic as well. Okay, so thank you very much for your time today. Um, yeah, thank you everybody. And um, uh, Connor Ross or Ross Connor, I can never, don't know whether it's um, transposed, but he's just put the link into the knowledge and skills gap in Australian secondary mathematics classrooms, the research that we found at this um, round table on today. So get onto our website and download that and have a good read. It's an easy read. Um, and it literally is a replay of what all our, uh, what many of our maths educators are saying from all over Australia about um, what they, where they think the gaps are and how we can, um, and how we might respond. But just on behalf of everybody today, thanks for joining us. And please join me in thanking our experts. I could actually sit here for another hour and keep talking, but I reckon Patrick might be a bit tired from his teaching day today and needs a break. Um, but thank you to Patrick, thank you to Peter, to Simone, um, to Janine, and to Kim, and to Evan. Thank you very much, Roundtable, on today. I'm navigating through the slides. It's been really terrific. I've really enjoyed myself, and I've, I've, I've learned some things today, which is what we always want to do when we turn up to sessions like this. So I hope you've got something out of it. So thanks very much. <laughs>